The time has come, fellow SITREP operators, for another visit to the Wargaming Table. I am your host, Ariskany Jim, and yet again my heart is stirred by the drum and the fife, and I find myself enraptured by the scent of musket smoke and horse shit. That's right, we're taking another look at the American Revolution with a game I've had set up all summer, and it's finally time to resolve this little skirmish. Not only in the name of American liberty and justice, but also I've had this set up on my dining room table for two and a half months, and my girlfriend is starting to lose patience with me. So, this is a game we actually started back in July for our Independence Day content we had, you know, for Independence Day, July 4th, uh, earlier this year. It's now, as you know, in the middle of September, it's probably finally time I get this wrapped up. We did have one complete turn of this game. If you're interested in how that kind of started off and what these beginning forces were in detail, you know, obviously there'll be a link to that previous video in the description of this one. You can check that out if you're interested. But long story short, take your first shot. Um, this was a demo game for the American Revolution in 20mm. Uh, the miniature sources, I, I, they're all over the place. I know I got a lot of them from Caesar miniatures, but a lot of them are from other places, so I can't really speak to that in specific detail. I've had some of these miniatures for, oh jeez, going on 10 years now, so I can't remember where a lot of them came from. But we're basically talking about 20mm American Revolution. This is, again, a demo game. We're not trying to do any specific battle here. We just wanted to show how uh, American Revolution is different from other conflicts in the black powder subgenre. So there's a lot of Napoleonics out there, there's a lot of American Civil War out there. That's all great, but American Revolution, while of course being black powder, does have its own little bit of flavor, and we wanted to take a look at how that, you know, how that looks on the gaming table. So what system are we going to use to resolve this little skirmish? Well, go ahead and get your laughs in now. But like I described in the previous video, the system I'm using is TSR's Battle System 2nd Edition for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Mass Combat. 2nd uh, Edition was first published, I think, in 1989. I know that sounds like a bizarre choice to use for an American Revolution War game, but like I described in the previous video, we go through all the bullet points about what makes this a great system to use in mass combat, even for a Black Powder Age uh, war game. Here are the losses that both sides have taken so far in turn one. Um, here we have the Patriots, and I'm especially aggrieved about those two figures of uh, Patriot Riflemen over there on the left-hand side. Here are the Crown losses, and yes, there are more of them, but I do actually think the Crown's about to turn the tide here, because looking at the table, as I'll show in a minute, there are more British barrels pointing at more American units than vice versa. So let's see how that turns out. So, to start turn two of this game, the first thing we do is roll initiative. It's very simple, both sides each roll a d10, and the British end up with a higher number, they choose who goes first. So the Americans have to move first, no worries. The unit I choose to move first are going to be these Patriot Riflemen here on my extreme left. The idea is to get them here into this farm field around the British flank, and maybe put some flanking fire into their wing, you know, later on this turn. So I'm looking here at their card, they have a movement rate of 12 inches. I'm going to pay one additional inch to cross that fence, and one additional inch to cross those trees and brush that are on the far side of the road. So as you can see there, I'm really only measuring 10 inches. Uh, a smooth move there, Paul Bunyan. Alright, and what we're going to do is we're going to move each piece 10 inches individually. Again, they're skirmishers, they don't really move as a unit. So because each unit moves 10 inches, not all of them are going to get in the best position. Uh, some of them are going to be kind of behind those trees, but no worries. Uh, at the immediate moment, however, that's only part of my problem. Uh, the bigger problem is that some British troops there in that farm field, they saw me run across that road. They saw those Patriot Riflemen run across that road. And they're going to take what uh, Battle System calls pass-through fire. It's a kind of opportunity fire. Basically, you shoot during the enemy's movement phase as he moves right in front of you. This is why when you win initiative, you usually make the enemy go first. So he moves and you basically get first shot on him. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and measure the range. Uh, not where the unit is, but where the unit was when they chose to take the pass-through fire. So, as you can see there, most of the ranges in Battle System are done by brackets. 0 to 5 inches is close range, up to 10 inches is medium range, up to 15 inches is extreme range. 
extreme range. That is one third dice, 2d4 per figure. You see it there on the card, times nine figures left, 18 dice. Make that six dice because of one third extreme range. Looks like they only got one hit though, so yeah, damn. So the Americans have taken a hit. They get a save on what Battle System calls AR, or armor rating. I know that doesn't sound right. Nobody in the American Revolution was wearing armor. That's not really what it is. It's a unit save based on formation. An open formation like Skirmishers gets a pretty good save. Six up on a D10. I'm going to give them a plus one based on that fence that the British had to shoot through. So it's one D10 per hit sustained. All right. So they only have to roll once. Um, they normally need a six. Now they need a five because of that fence. They get a six. That's a successful save. The Patriot Riflemen lose no figures. Okay, so here we are at the end of the American movement phase. They've done all their movement, and they've taken all the British pass through fire. So let's take a look at what happened here. This unit has moved forward. Um, they took a little bit of fire from that unit there across the road as they moved up behind that fence. Did lose a figure. However, they did uh, make the morale check. Now these two units moved up using a 45 degree oblique rule that I'm kind of showing with my ruler there. I did that so that I could clear line of fire for my artillery. I've got plans for that artillery coming up. Note what I'm doing with my regimental commanders there. I have to keep him close to the units that he commands because battle system has what's called command diameter. That's kind of common in a lot of games. And uh, it's pretty short for most units. The exception here is my big brigade commander. He pretty much commands the entire American force on the field. Um, so I'm keeping him kind of in the center. Uh, this uh, little regiment took a hit from those British guys across the field. Um, but again, they also made the morale check, so no worries there. Moving here to the center, I'm looking at this militia unit that moved up the road to that junction, sidestepped a little bit to the right, and then partially wheeled. Pretty complicated maneuver. He had a commander there to help him out with it. Although he did take some pretty close range pass through fire. The British rolled pretty well for a change. I lost two units, or two figures I should say. Their morale is pretty low. They're only state militia, but they did barely make their uh, their morale check. All right, so now this unit here had to move. He had to uh, sort of compress and sidestep a little bit to the right in order to stay in command diameter radius of this other unit way out here to the right. I'm trying to turn the British flank here with some more state militia. Once you get into that creek, it is half movement, um, but I'm looking like I'm about ready to put some uh, some fire into the British flank if all goes well. So the British are doing a lot better. They won initiative, they made the Americans go first, and thus walk into their musket fire for a change. So we'll see how it goes going forward. Now it's time for the British movement phase, which means the Patriots are going to be getting all the pass-through fire. The first thing the British have to do is reorganize this wing. It's in really bad shape. That first regiment has taken nearly 50% losses, and they are shaken, as you see there. So they're not allowed to move closer to any Patriot unit. The British are going to want to fall back, reorganize their formation for a morale bonus, but boom, as soon as they go to move, they take immediate pass-through fire from one, two, three, four Patriot Rifleman figures with unobstructed LOS, and two more with partial line of sight. So we'll go through how that gets resolved. Okay, so in basic terms, here's what's going to happen. These first four guys have unobstructed line of sight. They're going to roll normally, the British are going to save normally. Those other two guys down there behind those trees are firing through semi-obstructed line of sight. So any hits that they score, the British are going to get a bonus against those particular hits on their save. So we'll have to do that separately. Notice here that the rifle get 1d8 attack dice. So slower rate of fire, but um, a much, much better attack dice or much more accurate weapons. And the ranges are a lot better. They go, they don't do 5, 10, 15, they go 8, 16, 24. Again, American rifle. I'm measuring the range here, and honestly, only those first two figures, again, these are 20 men per figure, only those first two figures are within short range. So, after I knock my tree down there, I'm just going to go ahead and count those first four as medium range. Medium range means half attack dice. So those four D8s for four figures is going to go from four D8s down to two D8s. I'm going to go ahead and roll and see how I do. All right, that three equals no hits. That eight equals two hits. So, so far the British unit has suffered two hits. They're going to get two saves. Again, no bonuses because these guys have no uh, line of sight. Okay, that four 
is a hit, that 8 is a save. So that's going to be one figure knocked down. Alright, we're going to go ahead and roll British morale because they've lost the figure. Um, the morale for this figure is pretty good. Or the morale for this unit is pretty good. Yeah, morale level of 12. ML the colon 12. Uh, they're pretty solid. British line infantry was pretty solid. But they get a bad roll. Oh, 14. Okay, they fail the morale check. As you can see, they're already shaken, so now they are routed. When a unit is routed, it quite simply turns around on its heel and bolts. It starts legging it down the road as fast as it friggin' can. Line infantry has a full movement rate of 9 inches, so yeah, you just turn all the figures around and you move them 9 inches away from the enemy. However, it is still technically the British movement phase. When it's your movement phase and you're not in base-to-base -base contact with the enemy, and as I'm showing here, you are within command diameter of your uh, command unit, you're allowed to make a rally check. So I basically just have to roll under their morale on 2d10. They do barely make it with an 11, so that unit now returns to shaken status, because they started off as routed. They don't go immediately back to good order. So they will turn around and they'll revert to shaken status. The unit kind of recovers, but they did lose some ground there to those Continental Riflemen. Movement phase is now completed. Both sides have moved all units and completed all pass-through fire. We've already talked about this disaster that's unfolding over here on the British right. However, the one bad piece of news for the Americans over here is that those Patriot Riflemen will not get to shoot again for the rest of the turn. Please remember, this is all just the movement phase. This has all basically just been opportunity to fire. Now we're going to begin the actual combat phase, but those American Riflemen, for all their deadly range, only get to shoot once a turn. So certain units, like, these, like the artillery I was just showing, they only get to shoot once a turn. Everybody else now gets to shoot again. So those two sides are going to exchange a bunch more fire. Okay, we did manage to do some damage here to this British regiment here in the center. Uh, so those two units there show like basically the two halves of that regiment. One of those little regiment fragments there has now lost four out of its eight units, so it now has a morale penalty, as well as it has to take a morale check every single time it loses a figure now, because the, the unit is down to 50% strength and all these new morale triggers get cooked off. One spot where the British are doing a lot better, though, is over here on the Patriot right, where the Patriots were trying to turn their wing kind of like they're doing over there. However, over here, the British used that little bush of cover to sort of fall back, then re-pivot forward. Again, this game does not allow you to wheel to the rear like some games like I mentioned. But long story short, take your second shot of the day. The British have been able to use some clever maneuvering to stabilize this swing a little bit and present fire in two directions as the Americans try to close around them. So now the Americans are just dangerously divided. And oh, by the way, those are state militia. Those aren't the best of infantry there in that creek. So the Americans might be in a little bit of trouble over there on that flank. Alright, now that we're actually in the combat phase, technically the missile fire step, the two sides are going to exchange fire unit by unit, as opposed to one side moves everything and the other side shoots everything and vice versa like we saw during the movement uh, step. So the British won initiative uh, for this turn, so they're going to select the first unit to fire and they select their division of two six-pounder guns here. Notice they're going to be able to safely fire over their friendlies to hit their eventual targets. And that's because uh, their artillery is on high ground, obviously, and the friendlies are closer to the guns than they are to the eventual targets, which I'm indicating there with the ruler. So as you can tell, the British will be able to fire over the heads of their friendlies and hit the Americans on the other side. Honestly, the British artillery is better positioned. It's on high ground. The American artillery is back there in that little patch of low ground. My own units are in the way half the time. I, I didn't do a very good job with the Patriot artillery. So we're going to do this one first, like I said. That first gun has line of sight on that Continental Line unit out there on the farm field. Notice the gun on the other side, the gun over there on the right, is not going to be able to help because he has to shoot over that barn and that barn is closer to the target than to, his, than to him, so that's not going to work. So he's going to cross his fire over, and he's going to engage that state militia over there at the road junction. So let's go ahead and get some ranges here. All right, that first gun, like I said, is going to engage that Continental unit. As you can see, it's 20 inches or less. So there are the range brackets for the 6-pounders. He's going to be firing at medium range, which means his 2d8 is going to become 1d8. 
That other gun, like I said, can't help the barns in the way. He's going to engage that state militia, which is further away. As you can see here, yeah, that's more than 20 inches. So he's going to have to use the 30 inch range, which is one third of 2d8. Uh, by the time you round off the fractions, it comes out to 1d8 anyway. Let's fire off some British artillery. All right, that first gun is going to go ahead and fire into that Continental Regiment in the field. They get 1d8, they score an 8, that's awesome. All right, in battle system, that comes out to two hits. Notice there is no save against artillery. So once you get hit with artillery, you take the hits. Nothing's going to save you from, you know, ball and grape shot. So that's going to be two figures right off that American, uh, that American regiment there in the field. And they get an automatic morale check for being hit by artillery. They have a morale of 11. They do make it with a 9, so that unit does hold. That other gun is going to put some longer ranged fire, probably solid shot, into that uh, state militia there hiding behind the trees in the crossroads. Another D8. They score a 1. That's no effect. The American artillery phase, meanwhile, will not be nearly as impressive, I'm sorry to say. Same two six-pound guns, I just didn't place them nearly as well. So the first gun is going to fire through some of that scatter terrain. That's no problem there. It's a long-range shot. I'm going to try and put some solid shot into that British unit that is shaken in the road. However, if you notice the other gun, which was going to shoot at the exact same target, he was fine before. The problem is that British unit during its movement phase did take some fire from that state militia in the crossroads. They became shaken, and part of being shaken means you move back four inches. And as I move back four inches, notice if I try and draw a line of sight now between that second gun and that unit, I'm going to put a, a ball, a six pound ball, right between the shoulder blades of my commanding general. That's probably not a good idea. He probably is not going to appreciate that very much. So. Looking around for that second gun, I don't really see any other targets. I can't hit that British artillery on the high ground because I have friendly units that are closer to me than to the target. So that's not safe. And as I look around, I, I honestly don't see any other, uh, I don't see any other targets for that second gun. Like I was saying, I didn't place American artillery very well. I think that second gun is going to remain silent. But at least that first gun can go ahead and try to put some long range solid shot into that shaken regiment and maybe break it. We'll see. Alright, here we are at the end of the fire phase, and here are the losses that both sides have taken in this fire phase. Yeah, I think the British are turning the tide a little bit. Um, the Americans are definitely taking a lot more losses now, the British are making better use of cover, they're getting better saves, and they're just starting to roll better, to be perfectly honest. Okay, here we go with turn three. The Americans have one initiative, they're forcing the British to go first. So, the British are moving their units around, they're trying to stabilize their flank, they're trying to stabilize their center. They're taking some American pass-through fire, but nothing too dangerous. The British are making their saves and their morale checks. The one part of the British movement phase that's kind of interesting here is over here on the Patriot right. Those British companies are becoming dangerously close to those state militia right there. Now, they are in sort of knee-deep, thigh-deep, waist-deep water, so movement is halved. So their movement, which is normally nine, goes down to four and a half. Now, if they want to go ahead and declare a charge, they get a 50% bonus to their charge to their movement rate. So plus 50% on four and a half is like six and three quarters, something like that. So if I roughly sort of measure that out, um, I go ahead and I measure. Lo and behold, they are well within charge range, even with that water there. So, they do have to make what's called an Opportunity Charge Initiation Check. They did not declare this charge at the beginning of the turn. So they have to make their morale check minus 2. Their morale is 12 because they're line infantry, they're pretty solid troops. 12 minus 2 is 10, they barely made it. That charge is happening. Time to give the Rebels the cold steel. Alright, so just for the camera's sake, we're going to go ahead and move that tree for a minute. We know that those British companies are going to charge that state militia there. We've already measured the charge distance. We've taken the turn into account. We've made the opportunity charge initiation check. Now it's time for pass through fire. Those state militia are going to get some point blank musketry right in the British faces. It's one of the few times you're going to get a full musket blast. 2d4 per figure. There's five figures there, but even with 10d4s, damn, uh, they, they only got one hit. And then the British make their save! So they literally just charge straight through all that musketry. 
and didn't take a single figure loss. Okay, so yeah, now they move to base to base contact and the charge goes from here. Holy crap, here it comes. In battle system terms, we are considering fixed bayonets to be a short spear, like a six or seven foot spear. So in battle system, units equipped with short spears in melee combat get to fight two ranks deep. So that means that we're going to include all seven of these British infantry figures, that's 140 men, in this bayonet charge. Alright, so looking down here at their card, we see that they get attack dice six. That means they get to roll six sided dice per figure. And there's a total of seven figures there. Notice the state militia only gets a d4. Americans can trade gunfire with British infantry just fine. When it comes to a bayonet duel or a bayonet fight, yeah, it's a different story as we're probably about to see. So the British roll their seven dice. That's one, two hits, three hits, four hits, five hits. Oh man. All right, the Americans have been hit five times, therefore they get five saves. So they have to get an eight because they're only state militia. Eight up on a D10. That is no successes. Holy crap, that whole unit is wiped out, annihilated in place. Killed, wounded, captured. Holy mackerel. Now, okay, melee combat is simultaneous, so those Americans do get to fight back. There's only five figures there, though, and they only get D4s. And again, you have to get a four to score any hits at all. So, again, a D6 helps. So the Americans roll their 5d4. Looks like I looks like I got two successes. The British get to save. They save on a seven. They're better trained than the state militia. They save one. So those five American figures are all gone in exchange for one British figure gone. That, my friends, is what happens when the British manage to get close with bayonets. Things go the British way. Surprise, surprise. Here we are at the end of turn three, and I honestly think the battle is going to start to unravel very quickly from this point forward. Starting off over here on the Patriot right wing, <laughs> well, there isn't a Patriot right wing anymore. Please remember that that unit was wiped out in place by a British bayonet charge, and some other state militia I had here in this creek got the hell shot out of it, and the survivors are now routed and fleeing the field. So there's literally nothing in front of 260 intact trained British regulars except for an American command group. That's like a handful of colonels, some dispatch riders, some captains, and some adjutants. Yeah, that, they're not going to stop anything. They're not even a combat unit. So the British aren't winning on the right. They have won on the right. Over here in the center, it's not so much that the British have annihilated the Patriots, but the Patriots and the British have annihilated each other. There isn't a whole lot of infantry left. I do have some British survivors routing down the road. They ran right past their general. I do have another unit that has been shaken and driven back by massed American artillery fire, which has repositioned so it can finally do something for a change. But there's not much else left. I have a little bit of state militia here at the crossroads, which has taken 50% casualties. They're already shaken, and they're state militia, so they didn't start off with the best morale to begin with. They're not going to last very long, long story short. So the two sides have kind of annihilated each other in the center. There's not a lot of infantry left, just some command groups and artillery. However, the British artillery is on the better ground. So it's close, but if I had to sort of predict what was going to happen, I think the British are going to win in the center too. The one good spot for the Americans is over here on the Patriot left, which has been turned and now the Patriots are about to cave in the British right wing like it's nobody's business. We've got two remnants of two American regiments pretty much point blank pouring musketry into the face of what's left of the British. We've got uh, Patriot riflemen putting fire into their flank. Yeah. The British are making their saves. They're making their, their morale checks. That just means that more British soldiers are dying. They are getting mown down over here. But there is still a British wing. And that might also contribute to the overall outcome. In general, I would give the British two out of three. The British are pretty much winning in the center. They have already won over here to the right. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Trust me. They, they definitely won that one. So they've won in the center. They have already won in on the right. And over here on the left, the Patriots are winning. However, the British do still have a wing. 
It's going to last maybe one turn more, maybe a turn and a half, maybe enough time for them to fall back on that high ground and defend the flank of that artillery. So even the one piece of good Patriot news may have come like a turn or a turn and a half too late. So, yeah. I mean, we'll play one more turn and we'll see how it shakes out. Alright, so here we are at the end of turn four. And I'm going to go ahead and call this as a British win. Oh, I feel like I have to wash out my mouth uh, with soap after saying that, but it's true. Uh, the game has been played, the units have been maneuvered, the dice have been rolled, and this is where we wound up. So we've already talked about the American right, which basically doesn't exist anymore. We've got the bulk of a British regiment, or at least what's left of it, uh, 260 men. Um, that's about half strength of what a uh, late 18th century British regiment really should be at full parade ground strength. A little bit of American defense that I tried to mount here to shoot out across that clearing. Well, here's what's left of them, and they're not sticking around, so that didn't work. I've got some command groups over here. Yeah, colonels with pistols, that they're not going to stop anything. I even tried to reposition one of my six pounders to put a little bit of fire on there, but that only served to put them under uh, long range artillery fire from the high ground uh, from those British guns. So now that figure, is, or that artillery gun, is now shaken and has lost a figure. So, yeah, I've now got one gun that has no targets and one gun that has been damaged. You can see there it's missing a figure and it's now shaken uh, morale-wise. So yeah, the Americans pretty much don't have a center anymore. Over here on the American left, we do have a pretty solid victory over here for the Americans. So, I have to kind of look for them here because there really aren't that many left. As, you know, what's left of the British wing. Those guys are routed. Even that British command group has taken some hits, so... Some of those officers are now down, thanks to Patriot rifle fire. But yeah, it's just a little, it's too little too late, to be honest. The British have held on by their fingernails over here on the right, on their right, the Patriot left, just long enough. So the Americans have won on the left, the British have won in the center, to be uh, perfectly honest, and they have already won handily and clearly over there on the Patriot right. So, Patriot win, Patriot loss, Patriot loss, 2-1, to one. that is, uh, yeah, that's a 2-1 to one British victory. They're, they're not going to be naming any American aircraft carriers here for this battle, I don't think. We do have here one of the British command groups taking its little victory parade down the street. Here's another British uh, brigade command group. So, yeah, credit where credit's due, the British did win this battle. Their artillery is still in good shape on high ground. I think that was one of their better moves. So that's going to wrap us up for this video, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks very much for all your support, subscriptions, comments, everything you guys do. We really, really, really do appreciate it. But for now, this is Ariskany Jim signing off and saying, as always, Tango Mike for watching.